Jay Campbell is back. He is one of the authorities you'll find online with some of the best information on peptides, how to use them, what they do for you, where to find them. As we know, uh, peptides, along with bioregulators, fundamentally treat the root cause. And pharma wants to mandate with symptomology Got by it. giving products that don't do that because then the, the money tree is gone, right? Because now these people can take these drugs, which then create a cavalcade of side effects and other things that happen that they can sell more drugs for. Whereas peptides and bioregulators are actually literally, as he can tell you, will cure the issue altogether if used, you know, uh, correctly, you yeah. know, in surgically precise dosages. Jay Campbell's amazing. We've had other episodes with him. You guys told us bring him back. So we did. And today he brought Nick Andrews with him. This is a biochemical engineer who worked in biotech and pharma for 20 years. Okay. We have a complex system here. There are multiple things going wrong. If we can avoid it, we don't really want to start messing with hormones because that's a whole nother, you know, can of worms you don't want to open. Okay, cool. Well, there's a lot of other things we can do here. The cool thing about human physiology, the majority of the time, if you can give it a little bit of help, your body will start to fix yep. itself. That's kind of the a core principle really behind peptides is if you can help your body turn on the right things or provide the right conditions, your body knows how to fix stuff. It will go fix stuff. Now, why did we have them both on the show? Well, today they're talking about the truth about hair loss, how you can actually stop and reverse hair loss with peptides and it doesn't have anything to do with blocking DHT or messing with your hormones like some of the other popular hair loss drugs. In fact, they tell us those are bad for you and the ones that they talk about are actually pretty good. It's really interesting. In fact, I've been using some of their products and messing around with them and uh, I am noticing some effects. In fact, in today's episode, you'll hear them talk about some of these peptides and they do talk about a hair loss product that combines them. It is unique to them. They did make their own formula. This is a scalp health product. It is not something that we put into our hair. But to I, your question, yes, this is a everyday health of the scalp product that will strengthen the follicle and improve hair regrowth over time. Now you can get it and you can get it at a discount through Mind Pump. So if you're interested, you go to enteraskincare.com. That's spelled E-N-T-E-R-A skincare.com forward slash M-P-M. And then the discount code MPM gets you 10% off your order uh, or 10% off your first month as a subscriber of uh, some of their products. Pretty cool stuff. Today's giveaway, the Super Bundle. That's a lot of programs we're giving away, uh, but here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video, the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and then turn on your notifications. If you do all those things and you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. This is also the final day for the sale this month. The Beginner Strength Training Program, Map Starter, half off. And then we had a bundle that included MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Prime. That's the starter bundle. That's also half off. This is the final day for that. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Jay, welcome back on the show. And you brought a friend with you. I did, man. Nick Andrews is one of the smartest people on planet Earth, and it's amazing to be here with you guys. I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, so guys. we did. Oh, boy, you got a lot to, you got some big shoes to fill <laughs> with that, that opening statement so right we, there. So <laughs> we did a couple episodes with you, Jay, about peptides. You're, I mean, I found you, I talked about this on the other episodes. I found you online because your written content on peptide, peptide science, was some of my favorite. It was some of the best ones that I found online. You're considered an authority in that. And when we asked you to come on the show, you said, I got to bring this guy on because he is, he knows this stuff better than anybody. So for you to say that, it's a big deal. So I'd like to meet you, Nick. So, so what's your background and why does Jay think you're just like, you know, everything about this stuff? <laughs> Thank you, Sal. <laughs> no um, so come from a biochemical engineering background, education perspective, uh, worked in pharma and biotech for a little over 20 years. Kind of get tired of the corporate thing. Um, had already kind of gotten into the alt health space, peptides, you know, due to personal health challenges, probably like most people, ran into Jay around that time. And, uh, you know, we started building a friendship and, you know, it took off. So, you know, it was an interesting, interesting pathway because of the background in pharma, biotech, and from an educational perspective and being on the earlier side of the, you know, peptide revolution, right? Um, it just allowed me to have some unique insights and, you know, meeting some other great people like Jay in that space and doing some very cool things. What very did you, cool. what did you see? Like, so like coming from that background and then this, the, the increase of popularity in peptides, like what first like interested you like, Oh, this is going to be huge. Or like, what was, what was going through your thought process? 
Yeah, so for me, it was kind of a process of discovery. What really got me into it was uh, I had a lot of the cartilage in my one shoulder removed from a downhill mountain biking accident and was told, basically, you're going to have to have a joint replacement by the time you're 40. <clears throat> and I was 30 years old at the time. I, was, I knew enough at that point to know that's the wrong answer. <laughs> so I knew there was a lot of stuff out there. I'd never gone deep on it, really. So started going deep on pretty much everything. Like, let, let's, their answers, let's go find them. Yeah. And it took about two years of just completely geeking out on any avenue I could find that was a potential route. And at, like I said, after about two years, kind of honed in on peptides and was like, okay, time to be a guinea pig. So, you know, did my homework on the individual peptides, you know, looking in, you know, pros, cons, you, you, like you see all the time, not as much anymore, but oh my God, peptides are going to give you cancer. All right, well, let's do our homework. What are the pathways? How does it work? Is that a real concern or is it just noise? And uh, in my opinion, this, that's a whole nother discussion, but for the most point, noise. So ran cycles for about a year and pretty much had almost full functionality, excuse me, full functionality back in my shoulder. And to put it in perspective, when I started that whole process, I could maybe do one push up, and that's it just because it was bone on bone. Wow. Wow. So, okay. So I have a suspicion that because I just started diving in deep into the peptide space uh, maybe over the last year. Okay. So before that I'd heard about it. People had talked about it. I'd heard about things like BPC one five seven and, you know, growth hormone releasing peptides or whatever. And I, I largely ignored it because my understanding at the time was, ah, oh, it's kind of gray market. And then we have supplements that we work with that people can buy over the counter. Um, and uh, so I kind of largely ignored it. Then I started diving in deeper and learning about them. And I said, oh my God, why aren't pharmaceutical companies all over this stuff? My sneaking suspicion is because it's harder to patent them and make it so that you're the only one that sells particular pet. Is that why, because people hear some of these episodes about peptides are like, well, why aren't, why aren't these like the greatest, biggest pharma blockbusters? Yeah. Like what's the deal? Is that, is that why? Is it because you can't necessarily patent them in the same way? Yeah, that's a major element. So, I mean, it, it the why isn't really obvious unless you've worked in the pharma industry, then you're like, oh yeah, of course, it, it's that sort of thing. If you haven't seen how the sausage is made, it doesn't make sense. Uh, peptides, you know, essentially a, a long amino acid chain. So amino acids are kind of like the individual Lego blocks. A peptide is when you start stacking a whole bunch of them together. And then if you stack peptides together, you get proteins. So that's the, the simple breakdown of the differences there. Mm -hmm. With peptides, the vast majority of them, um, you know, I think it was kind of a couple strings tangled together with branches hanging off. In a lot of cases, you only need a fragment to actually produce the biological effect. So if you're a pharma company at BPC-157, uh, actually, better example, TB-500, thymus, and beta-4, mm -hmm. there's always a lot of confusion around that. Are they the same thing? Are they not the same thing? No, they're actually not. But that gets directly to this, because thymus and beta-4 is the full-length human-equivalent molecule that you would find in a human. TB500 is they basically just cut part of that chain off and only took the part that they need that's still biologically active. Oh, okay. So from an industry perspective, if you're a pharma company and you patent and try to launch thymus and beta-4, you're going to spend anywhere from $500 million to almost a billion dollars to get through approval. The second you get approved, I can come behind you and use your filing <laughs> with a shortened molecule to launch my product for anywhere from 200 million to 300 million. So from day one, you lost money. You will never make it back. You're fired and you will never work in pharma again. Wow. wow. I mean, that's kind of like the, that makes so much remember sense. the old supplement hustle, right? Yep. Where you would, you would create a supplement that was real close to like a, like a, a steroid. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden they'd come out, right? You'd run it. People would sell it. They would tell all their friends. They would go gangbusters. Then all of a sudden they'd come crack down on it and say, oh, this is now on the list of illegal. Right. And someone would come right behind that, change it by like a molecule, yep. and then run, it's like, well, so for same game. That's, for a, that's how Patrick Arnold made his living. Do you guys he, know Patrick? Yes, yes. 100% Oxo. Who is that? Oxo Who is that? Arnold. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick Arnold, he's a good friend, yeah. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They, he came out with a supplement that was an aromatase inhibitor, yep. um, and because it didn't fall under the category of uh, regulated aromatase inhibitors, it was able to be sold over the counter, but it was almost as effective as... <laughs> it was a loophole supplement, is yes. what they called it. Yeah, and the, a lot of the designer steroids at the time uh, That's were exactly like that. That's exactly what they are. But yeah. this sounds different. This almost sounds like I come out with a supplement that, let's say it's a multivitamin, 
and it's got creatine in it. And people buy it and they're like, ooh, I build muscle. And then another person comes out and says, it's the creatine that's building muscle. Let's just sell that. Now my product that's $100 for a bottle, you could sell for $15 a right. bottle. People get the same result. So in other words, the laws that we currently have that protect companies against you know, other people copying them, yeah. it's almost impossible to create regulations and laws that would protect a pharma company from competition with peptides. Thus, they're not going to put them out and sell them and talk about them much because- why would they when they are going to put something out and someone else is going to be able to come out with an active version of it? There, there's one other thing, and he can address this, and I'll just put it out there. But as we know, uh, peptides, along with bioregulators, fundamentally treat the root cause. And pharma wants to mandate with symptomology Got by it. giving products that don't do that because then the, the money tray or the money tree yeah. is gone, right? Because now these people can take these drugs, which then create a cavalcade of side effects and other things that happen that they can sell more drugs for. Whereas peptides and bioregulators are actually literally, as he can tell you, will cure the issue altogether if used, you know, uh, correctly, you yeah. know, in surgically precise dosages. I mean, so a good example of that is look at the hep C treatment. Um, there are multiple versions of it. It goes by multiple names, but essentially hep C cure. In the U.S. and Europe, they charge anywhere from fifty thousand to thirty thousand dollars for it. Uh, in India, I think it's like twelve hundred dollars. Wow! Um, when Big Pharma originally launched that, Wall they, they actually there were multiple articles published by the Wall Street Journal and other articles saying, "Is this a sustainable model?" And they took a lot of heat from Wall Street. Because the barrier you're talking about is a combination. It's the regulatory barrier, which we were just going through, but it's also the financial barrier. So any public company is entirely beholden to Wall Street function. What's my stock price? Is it of going course. up? Is it going down? So when you spend five hundred million, a billion dollars to get a product launched, Wall Street's going to say, "Cool, what's your twenty-year earnings on this?" And they base that essentially on a subscription model for all intents right. and purposes. That's exactly. What so it when is. they say, "Whoa, whoa, 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 this is a one-time purchase," we have a problem here. So they will penalize your stock. Yeah. So, and, and now I want to be, um, just for the audience listening, uh, this isn't necessarily, this is just a symptom of how things work. This isn't the root of all evil. Right. Um, we need investment. We profit. need research. Yeah. We need yeah. profit. However, when you understand the system, then you start to see that, for example, if I'm a pharma company and I want to come out with a cancer treatment, and I know that- there's these different types of chemotherapy that have all been approved right. that have this type of return. And then I have this experimental potential pathway. I don't know if it'll work. If it's not going to work, I got to spend a billion dollars to figure it out. Right. Yeah. I'm going to go with this guaranteed right. return versus this is why you see pharma companies not branching out into more experimental potential uh, solutions because they're going to look at more like what other kind of opiate can I create? Right. What other right. kind of right. whatever can I create that kind of does this similar thing that maybe is a little less symptoms and so on. So that I think is important to understand. And now why, when we're talking about peptides, uh, legit, if you look, and I've been diving deep into this, it's crazy yeah. at what they, some of these can do. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading about them, I say to myself, why, why isn't this like standard of care? Like what's going on? Like, for example, I, I, I learned this the other day that, uh, peptides are not, so drugs kind of force your body to do certain things. Peptides, your body already recognizes, in essence, and it does what it would normally do when presented with this, you know, yeah. peptide information. Is that yeah? Kind of I mean, so think of peptides as a key and a lock. So to open the door to a process running, um, a healing process, or regenerative process, whatever, whichever one you're targeting, you need a key to open that lock to turn the process on, right? Mm -hmm. So your body has its own keys to those locks. You know, its own endogenous peptides, mm. the molecules your body normally produces. We can mimic those exactly in a lab or whatever variation we want, quite frankly. Um, when you're using essentially synthetic chemicals, they're not specifically targeted, hence why you get all kinds of side effects. Right. Right. And this is also why, generally speaking, while there are certainly exceptions, peptides rarely have any real side effects because you're copying the body's exact key and that key only does what it's supposed to. Oh. It, it doesn't go hitting other locks that it shouldn't be opening Versus think of like a more of a synthetic or chemical drug um, as just a skeleton key. I got a skeleton key. It'll open this door. But the problem is, is it's going to open 20 other doors that I didn't want to open. Oh, that's a great example. So people don't know a skeleton key is a key that uh, opens many, many locks. You want it to just open one, but now you've caused all these other issues. 
Wow. So it would be, is this a good example? Um, I have chronic pain. I could take an opiate or uh, I could find a way to get my body to produce its own natural opiates. And that would be a very different uh, yeah. process. Okay. I mean, so for example there, you know, it, you would have to get into the root cause a little bit, but depending on the root cause in this example, you can look at something like ARA290. Okay. There, there's a, a ton of literature on that. You know, there's understood mechanisms for why it can help with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you can literally go straight to the root causes. Now, yes, obviously some of that's going to come from lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. In my case, I crashed a freaking mountain bike ripping down a mountain. Um, but maybe, you know, you have a predisposition to something or your, your lifestyle just really wasn't where it should be. You weren't taking care of yourself. So yeah, you got to address underlying factors. Otherwise it's fundamentally a patch. Mm. But if you address the underlying, con you know, factors that allowed it to come up in the first place, you're regenerating, you're resetting, you're rebuilding. So it, it's not a patch. Mm. Now, when you first started getting into this, uh, coming from the, you know, kind of, you know, the, the medicine space, and then you come into this space and it feels now like it's starting to become more accepted, maybe a little more mainstream, but for a while there, it, it sounds like it was probably kind of like this gray market. Like you got to kind of fight a lot of the, Oh no, that's not what works and that's dangerous and don't go there type of deal. So how was that for someone like you? I mean, functionally in, in the beginning when I was first getting into it, I know when Jay was first getting into it, honestly, most people were like, Oh, like you're, you're injecting drugs. Like, <laughs> like you're living out on, yeah. on the corner with like heroin or something. Okay. And it, it was like, like, why would you inject something <laughs> in your body? Like, yeah. like, dude, like, I think you need some help. And you're like, but you know, as, as we've all seen, right over the last, especially the last like four years, but even over the last 10 years, people have really started to wake up that, you know, not far, big pharma is not inherently bad. There's a lot of good things yes. out there, but there are a lot of things in it that are problematic and there are legitimately alternative paths. Mm. And people have become far, far more aware of that. Yeah. I, I don't want my audience to get mad when I say this, but it's true. I mean, Big Pharma has created a lot of solutions, but at the end of the day, as you said at the very beginning of this podcast, it's the origin of the business model yeah. that is the problem, mm -hmm. where it's for profit or bust. And that is why Big Pharma has created this, but it's it's really more just, again, a symptom of the endemic causation of how do we create drugs and then keep that drug pipeline going so that that person can use it for 20 plus years of their life. Yeah. I'm going to go even far further and I think I'll, I'll, I'm going to narrow it down again because I am a unabashed uh, supporter of markets. And the big problem I think here is we've created a system where in order to get something to market, your initial investment is a billion dollars. That's right. So you have to figure out a way to profit that much or more. Otherwise, it's a complete waste of Loss. time. Yes. It's a complete waste of time. If the market were different, if the regulatory process allowed for them to take more chances, and I don't know what that would look like, right. maybe put more responsibility in the hands of the consumer, maybe put a ranking on it and look, your terminal, here's a risky drug, it's up to you. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Right. But the the it's the cost of bringing these things to market that make the, the, that they, it, it makes no sense. Right. I, I'm a business owner. Right. If you told me, Hey Sal, here's these things that are going to work really well. And I'm like, it's going to cost me a right. billion dollars to put that out. And I'm going to make a million dollars. And it's put a it 50, out? 50 chance it makes it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't well, make Nick, any you've been in this space for decades. Uh, what, how would you do it? If you had the opportunity to, to do it, how would you yeah. do it? So really there, there are two fundamental pieces. You can't have, we'll, we'll say a, a net positive, pharmaceutical industry that's tied to Wall Street. That doesn't mean it can't be a profitable business, but if you're tied to Wall Street, you are tied to quarterly earnings, you know, what are your projected earnings? And if you're not hitting those targets, you will be penalized. Got so it. it becomes a race to the bottom. Totally. Whoever is the most ruthless at hitting those uh, earnings targets, you will be massively rewarded by the market mm -hmm. and you will instantly outcompete everybody. So it forces everybody to play that game. Mm -hmm. So it, absolutely, I, I'm with you. You know, free markets, you know, the pursuit of profit is fundamentally a great thing. But the the problem in pharma is you end up inadvertently with a lot of adverse incentives. So you would have to come up, and I'm certainly not a Wall Street guy, with some alternative way for them to be plugged into markets, not in the standard fashion. They would probably need certain limits and guardrails so that big money can't come in, and not even necessarily intentionally, right? Money just wants to go where it's used. 
but even inadvertently create all these adverse incentives. Yeah, so I have an idea around that because I, I, I remember experiencing this firsthand with a family member who had terminal cancer. And I remember her diagnosis was terrible. So she had uh, stage four linitis plastica. This is a form of stomach cancer. Like your survival rate is Done. essentially zero. Done. Okay. Yeah. And I remember at that point, you're terminal and you still couldn't take whatever you wanted. No, 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 Crazy. we can't. And I remember thinking, she's going to <laughs> right, die. Right, who cares? If she wants to do cocaine right, every day, exactly. she should be allowed right, to, right, like literally. Yeah. So not saying that that would be a good idea, but my point was, <laughs> my point with that was, I, I could see how the system uh, creates these kind of perverse incentives. So I, I mean, personally, uh, I don't know if this is a great solution, but I thought a lot about this. And I think I would like a rating system. Like this has this many years right. of proven, this is, the, this is experimental, it's code red use at your own risk. And then people would say, well, sh you know, I'm already right, terminal. Right. I'm going to go with the, cause I'm dying anyway. Type That's of the answer. Allow the consumer the choice. Yeah. yeah. And going back to what you just said, it's the Pareto principle in play. Again, you've got way too many losers in that system yeah. and the winners take the lion's share of everything. And then they also garner the, you know, political clout because yeah. they're the Pfizer, you know, they're the Gen tech, they're the big names. Yeah. And that's where the system has gone. Unfortunately. Yeah. I, I totally understand. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, I know we're going off on a tangent, but you know, uh, there's a, there's a empowered people and then there's disempowered people. Right. And if you keep people reliant, uh, independent, well, you have a lot of power. Um, yeah. but when they're empowered, like when they exercise, eat yeah, right, exactly. that kind of stuff. And from my understanding with peptides, when you look at the way that they're used, oftentimes it's like, oh, you use this for a few months and then the things work the way they're supposed to and then you're done. Yeah. I don't hear that with drugs. Nobody yeah. ever does that with drugs. It's always like, <laughs> use this in, in forever, Yeah, essentially. Until they die. Which is kind of interesting, <laughs> right? The side effects from the drug. Yeah. yeah. So, and now how, why is that? Is it because the peptide kick starts or moves things moving in the right way and then you're cool? I mean, for the most part, most peptides are fundamentally regenerative. Okay. So, and that happens through a lot of different pathways and it depends on the peptide and the tissue involved and various other factors. But if you look at what I'll call most synthetic compounds, most pharmaceutical compounds, they fundamentally can't be regenerative. There are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, um, an easy example is Adderall, right? Mm. So people can legitimately have a, you know, a situation due to many causes where you don't produce a whole lot of dopamine, right? So, you know, you're going to struggle with those sorts of effects. Yeah, you can take Adderall, right? And you're going to be on freaking point. Um, but that has a cost, right? Yeah. You know, I, there, there's no free lunch with Adderall. Like you'll fly high for a little bit, then you're going to crash and then you're stuck on it. If you don't mm -hmm. take it, you're going to sit there and yeah, do receptors down regulate yep. and yep. your body becomes desensitized and you need more. I know this because I had, I have a prescription and yeah. I stopped it for that exact reason. Yeah. Horrible but drug. You man. get on to the peptide side, and there are multiple peptides, especially when you start. I don't know if you're familiar with BDNF. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we talked and about that. You, you start, you know, turning up BDNF. Once again, more of something is not always better. So you, you got to understand what you're doing and, you know, work responsibly with your body's systems. But yeah, you don't need the Adderall. Like, mm -hmm. the, yeah, anybody who takes Adderall is going to love it, right? But if you use peptides and you bring in diet and lifestyle as well, because that's part of your physiology, how your body regenerates, I've worked with a number of people and gotten them way past that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm one of them. I mean, I yeah. use uh, I, C Max, uh, yep. helps yeah. do that for me. I know that raises BDNF. Um, and then, of course, lifestyle makes a, 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 a very big difference for me. And the Adderall itself, I, I, you know, I started developing bad uh, relationship with it and I, yeah. I had to stop. I was like, this yeah. is a crazy ass drug. I got to get off. Well, I, and if yeah. you look at it, a, a lot of the typical dopaminogenic compounds, uh, methylphenidate, Adderall, so on and so forth, a really unfortunate longer term effect they don't tell a lot of people about is it reduces your empathy yeah, over time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so your personality is going to shift over time wow. in a less fa favorable way. Wow. And that's, that, that, that's something nobody nice wants to talk about. <laughs> Adderall, do you take Adderall? <laughs> 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 that we've been taking for so long. 
That's very interesting. And yeah, these things do shape the brain and, and, and shape our bodies. And but do you guys actually, I mean, this serious question, do you guys know anybody who's ever not had, or I'm sorry, had an Adderall prescription that didn't come off of it for the same reasons that you're talking yeah, about? A lot it of, does yeah. the same thing to everyone. Yeah, well, really I, I remember the first, I actually didn't uh, try an Adderall pill until uh, I was almost 40. I was in my mid thirties. The first time I ever tried one and it blew me away. Yeah. On, that they give it to kids. Yeah. They, like Dude, it, think yeah. about that. If Every I kid in it, college if I today is on Adderall. Nine o'clock in the morning. It fucked my sleep up yes. that night. Oh yeah. That's how, and it, yes. I was taking a very mild dose. Probably 15 of, milligrams. Yeah. Probably, right. And when they I give heard them they, 30 they put and kids 60 on this stuff, I thought, holy shit, this is, this is the real deal, man. It's That's nuts. Bro. Yeah. It's, it's scary to think that. Okay. Yeah. So, you're, you're you're someone Nicole. I'd love to ask, like, in a, in a, this is a bit of a vague question, but still, um, there's there's hundreds of these things, right? Are, are there are there certain peptides that that get you really excited compared to other ones? Like, is there a, a group or class of them that you're just like, this is this is the ill nana compared to <laughs> the other fifty or whatever? There's so many. Yeah, um, you know, fundamentally, at the end of the day, I think. Uh to keep it simple, I'll, I'll use the name interchangeably, uh, thymus and beta four or TB 500, but, um, TB 500 and BPC, because they hit so many regenerative yeah. pathways, um, even in the brain. Mm -hmm. So basically you can almost name, uh, dysfunction in the body and without even they help Googling with anything or looking at it, there's a 90% plus chance I can sit here and just randomly say, BPC and TP500 will help that. Wow. And then we can go jump on the computer and it's going to be like, oh shit. Yeah, it does. Wow. wow. Now, yeah. does uh, BPC, um, when you take it orally, I know it's supposed to help with gut health. That's how I take it. But yeah. does it also have a systemic effect when you take it orally or is it purely for gut health at that point? So Mostly. The, the problem with peptides, and this is why they're primarily injection, is they are extremely fragile molecules. Nice. Um, once again, a few exceptions, but generally speaking, extremely fragile um, you have all sorts of enzymes and other compounds in your mouth and your digestive system okay. that naturally break down peptides, proteins, and amino acids as soon as they enter. Right. So for the most part, peptides are not biologically active to any significant degree orally. Now, you have a modified form of BPC-157, arginine the arginate, mm. um, which you basically had an extra piece added onto the end of the molecule that allows it to survive passing through the stomach that really doesn't tend to be systemic. It does tend to stay in the digestive tract. Okay. So for somebody with digestive issues, yeah, a great tool. If yeah. you're like, dude, my shoulder, my knee, my elbow's messed up, it's really- Then you want to go sub, right. sub Q. Well, so not without naming names, because we don't do that on this show, uh, <laughs> a lot of the BPC uh, formulations, as he and I could tell you, are not worth the label they're printed on because well, they don't really. have arginine in it. And so when they get into the stomach, they're instantly destabilized. And the, Oh, that's the pill form ones you're talking about. Almost, yep. okay. almost negligible. In fact, if you went on Facebook right now, and again, we're not going to name names and you went through, you know, the ads and they behaviorally targeted all of us because we're all peptide <laughs> users and you saw a Wolverine or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right. And you get this oral capsule. That is, if you tested it, completely worthless. Interesting. Interesting. I've been using the oral with KPV and I think I've been noticing some pretty positive effects. Yeah. Cause yeah, it's no, organized. So uh, that's another legit one. And so it also depends on how it's delivered. Yep. Um, so you have capsules that um, dissolve most capsules, right? The standard gelatin ones yeah. that dissolve basically they start dissolving as soon as you put them in your mouth and in your stomach, uh, you have another sort of capsule called enteric. Um, right. it, it's a modified type of capsule, so it won't dissolve in your stomach. It doesn't dissolve until it gets into your intestines. Right. Got it. So it just releases everything there. So putting KPV in an enteric capsule, honestly, even regular BPC-157, um, you are going to get some function with regard to the gut. Totally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I've noticed uh, some really, really awesome uh, gradual but compounding effects yeah. uh, on my gut health. That's actually a really good way to address um, gut issues mm -hmm. because it's going to focus almost all of the action right there in the gut. Well, something back to what he said, and, you know, Dr. Gordon, have you guys had Mark Gordon on your guys' show? We have not, but I'll, yeah, I'll get we'll write that down. So we, okay. I'll, get, I'll get him on your show. He's a good friend of mine. But um, he loves uh, a surgically precise dose of what he just said, BPC and TB500 for all of his TBI military guys. Because as he said, it massively addresses brain swelling. And that's what those guys have from concussive blasts and wow. being in the field. So over time, a very, I mean, honestly, he's 
told me, I mean, like those guys should be on T, uh, TB 500 and PPC 157, like in a surgically precise dose, like almost, if not daily, every other day, like for life until wow. Wow. they're cleared because wow. that's what it is. It's I brain mean, swelling. Yeah. I mean, you look at, you know, like the, the combat, the military, uh, you know, TBI sort of thing, a guy comes in from the field and, you know, whether it was an IED or whatever, you know, sort of blast he was exposed to. If just the first thing you did was say, we're basically going to give you a, a fat dose and right. there's a couple peptides and, you know, you can geek out as to what the best stack would be. But basically there are two or three different stacks. Pretty much all of them would include BPC and TP500. Mm -hmm. Then you can get into other things like uh, Cortexin, Cerebralysin, okay. um, actually MT1, CMAX. So, but without getting into the weeds, you hit them with that the second they come back. And the vast majority of their TBI will never fully manifest. That's true. Wow. That's because absolutely true. TBIs are like a lot of injuries. Think of sunburn. You know, look at me, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you first come in, even though I may be red as a lobster, the actual burn process has just started. The inflammatory cascade that's going to cause the peeling and that's all right. the pain is still actually ongoing and hasn't fully formed yet. So- if you can interrupt that process as early as possible, the full injury, whether it's a sunburn or TBI, never actually develops. Yeah, that's why they've shown oh. studies with people with uh, better fatty acid profiles and aspirin is preventing the actual burn from the sunburn, by the yeah. way. It's, it's, well, it's so, along those lines. You know, Jay didn't believe me when you know we were first starting out together. Um, how impressive, for example, GHKCU can be topically. So in the middle of the summer, I purposely went out Pretty much all day without a shirt, got myself lobster red. And, you know, I have pictures. a bit of fun experiment. To I watch. have pictures. <laughs> yep, text me a picture. I'm like, dude, look, I'm freaking lobster red, and it, this isn't the most cost effective way to prove a point. But basically, <laughs> slathered myself down in a GHKCU serum I made just for proving this point, and applied it like on one side, right? Uh, yeah, well, everything except for the one arm, because yeah. like otherwise it's really gonna suck. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I came in in the evening, slathered it on before bed, got up in the morning, put it on again, and put it on about three times a day. And by the third day, no sunburn, no peeling, except, except for the one right arm, there. which was like, wow. oh, my God, It's my profound. But wow. you can't talk about the, as you know, when we were lectured by our attorneys for, with our company many times that you can't talk about the UV protection of GHKCU because that's a whole nother thing. That's that a protected, regulated, uh, that's you know, a area. whole nother element of big pharma that you have to deal with. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we specifically wanted to talk about, um, a subject that is another huge market. It's a very, very big market. It's such a big market. In fact, that the most commonly used drugs that are used to treat what I'm about to talk about were actually initially researched for other purposes, but because this was a side effect, they said, oh, the money's there. Let's go in this direction. And this is hair loss, especially with men. Now, the reason why we're talking about this today is last time I had you on, Jay, you, you lightly touched on hair loss and the way that we work or try to treat hair loss is through blocking DHT and you went on a rant about how terrible <laughs> of an idea that is. So let's start there. The current understanding of androgenic alopecia or hair loss is DHT, which is a hormone that your body makes off of testosterone, right. attaches to receptors in the scalp. Those receptors then can cause hair loss. And if you have more DHT receptors, then you're more likely to have hair loss. If you have less, then you're less likely to have hair loss. Therefore, you want to not have hair loss, block DHT or block the receptors. That's the current accepted protocol. You were saying that's complete bullshit and terrible. Let's talk about that first for a second. Why is that not a great approach? So you run into this a lot. So is that wrong? It's actually not wrong. But here's the problem is it's they have chosen one little piece of a much bigger puzzle so when you see that piece in isolation, it leads you to paths, which aren't really constructive because you're ignoring the rest of the situation. It would be, it'd be like, you know, the oil in your car, right? Um, saying, well, you know, um, never changing the oil in your car and saying, well, I just add more when I need it. And then you wonder why your engine breaks down okay. when the car is 50,000 miles. Well, if all you ever looked at was the oil level and not all the other pieces of the car, you're going to be doing the entirely wrong thing. Like, dude, okay. don't just keep adding more oil. You, you you actually have to change oil and address other parts, right? Mm. So 
DHT can build up in the scalp. It, it, absolutely, all that is, is entirely accurate. But here's the issue is, you know, we were uh, an article about this a while ago. It's interesting. You can look at infants. You can look at women. You can look at um, other situations in men where you can show very, very high levels of DHT in the scalp or other areas of the skin that have a lot of hair or hair follicles. You won't see hair loss. So now, now the question is why? Well, if you start digging down into it, you find that DHT is not a root cause. It is a contributing factor. Oh. So, you know, it, if I put enough pressure on the DHT pathway, right, um, you know, DHT suppression, you know, you know, multiple pathways there, yes, you will absolutely show an improvement. But you still have all the other broken pieces underneath that. You're just taking enough pressure off the system so the hair can grow even though the rest of the system is broken. Okay. So someone and listening, getting worse. Well, yeah. I was just going to say, so someone listening might be like, okay, cool. Who cares then? Right. But uh, knowing what I know about the human body, DHT has a lot of effects, not yes. just making you lose your hair sometimes. Well-being, it's the most powerful anabolic uh, cascade of testosterone. Uh, and then, of course, um, it's a, it, it offers uh, sexual functioning. So when you crush DHT, which obviously any man who's ever uh, suffered from what is called PFS, right? post finasteride syndrome can talk to you about. It is so bad that it causes massive depression. And uh, a lot of people, and you know, again, this is in the clinical literature now, have killed themselves from having PFS. There's been lawsuits over the suicide. Yeah, I mean, massive. I mean, you know, we've again, we've written articles about all this stuff. But yeah, I like to look at it as like this. You'd never want to block a God-created biological pathway. When you do that, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm. So it's like, let, oh, cool. My hair grew back, but now I'm depressed. I can't get a boner. I feel terrible. And so, okay. So DHT, let's talk about that hormone for a second and, and all the things that it, it does for the body. Because one thing I know, by the way, you mentioned PFS. Yeah. Finasteride, for people who don't know, is a dr one of the most popular drugs that blocks the or reduces the conversion of testosterone to DHT. Correct. So now you have less DHT. By the way, a lot of people don't know this. If you take finasteride or dutasteride, which is another one, and you and you now have lowered DHT, men will sometimes see a rise in testosterone because less of it goes to DHT, and yet they're still getting erectile dysfunction and right. depression. Just goes to show you that this DHT is that important. You can have more yes. testosterone and still feel... You know, the, bio really? the biological pathways are very intricate. And again, when you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, blocking one to effect of another, you're causing downstream effects. Okay. Now let's say somebody's like, well, I don't get sexual side effects from it. I don't get these other effects. Are there any health implications from blocking DHT yes. that you might not oh, see till much oh, later? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jay and I, you know, I've been shown a, a data set. It hasn't been published yet. Not published. Hopefully before too long in the future. And this has been, you know, suggested this may be occurring for a while. But if you start looking at markers of cellular aging, people who are on DHT blockers are aging at a massively accelerated insane. rate at the cellular insane. level. How, how are companies like Bosley and stuff like that still in business? Then? Because like, nobody ever tests their cellular markers. There's, I mean, you've only got true diagnostic and glycan age, and, and there's now another company coming into the marketplace, but nobody knows that. If, so basically what he's trying to say is, if you looked at these guys' telomerase expression, right, which we know the peptides, which we talk about, right, mm -hmm. epithalon and thymolin yes. actually improve telomerase expression as we get older. But if you look at their telomerase receptors or their expression, it is, as he said, literally degrading their telomeres. Yeah, the other thing too, and this is what a lot of people might not realize, I've read other studies on, on, on other drugs, and this is why specific studies are so important because oftentimes it's hard to connect uh, a, an effect to a particular drug right. because you don't necessarily anticipate it, right? So it's like, oh, I'm taking this, uh, this drug that blocks the acid production in my gut. Now, you would expect potential gastro issues mm -hmm. or digestive issues or maybe even digestive inflammation. You might not expect a higher rate of a certain type of cancer, for right. example, yeah. which they've connected it to, for, yes. or a higher rate of uh, dementia, which yeah. they've connected you know, some of these protein pump you know, uh, inhibitors to. So that's one of the examples I'm using. So you could use something that makes your hair grow back, and then you wouldn't necessarily connect it to uh, depression. You know That might happen six months, a year later, four years later type of deal. Yep. So unless you study it, you're not going to make those connections uh, at all, especially in a, a, definitely not on a large scale. And nobody's, as you just said, uh, nobody's actually seeing the 
um, links or the corresponding data because people are just doing their biomarkers on labs from blood values, right? They're not actually looking at their telomeres. They're not looking at their DNA. Now, again, it's out there. There are testing procedures out there. And as he said, like the companies that are involved in this are not really ready to go public with the data sets, but they have enough data now to see very corresponding, excuse me, um, information that shows that blocking uh, DHT is not good for your biological health. Wow. So now let's talk about another popular. So dutasteride, finasteride, both of those in that category of DHT blockers. Uh, another common over-the-counter anti-hair loss uh, drug is minoxidil. Now, from my understanding, minoxidil was originally researched as a blood pressure lowering drug. Correct. During the research, they saw people grow back their hair. And they said, well, this is a better market. Let's go in this yeah. direction. <laughs> Just so, like Cialis. Okay, so exactly. Cialis, <laughs> Goes back the to Viagra was supposed yep. to be lowering blood pressure. We got boners. Forget the blood pressure. Let's go with the bone. Okay, so uh, minoxidil, what does that do uh, to help with hair loss? Its core method of action is to increase blood flow in the scalp, which think of it kind of like a clogged pipe, okay. right? So as DHT builds up, blood flow is already – so restricted blood flow is a core element of essentially any type of hair loss with a few exceptions. So when you have restricted blood flow, all the normal cellular waste inflammatory products that are building up, your body has processes for flushing them, getting rid of them. But if you don't have enough blood flow, if the pipes are clogged, you can't flush it out. doesn't matter. Right. Okay. So it's just going to sit there and it's just over time, slowly going to, you have a little bit of flow. So it's not overnight, but over time, all that cellular waste, which now initiates other inflammatory cascades, just builds up and builds up and builds up. Now you're losing hair left and right. Okay. So minoxidil, by increasing blood flow, is helping to flush those elements out. Okay. Unfortunately, hair loss is not just as simple as blood flow. It, it, it's- Multi-pronged. It, yeah. It's shockingly complex when you actually dig into it. Okay. So, Before we, I want to get into yep. all the all the pathways that you guys have identified. We've talked about the software and I, th I found it very fascinating. Um, but I do want to, full disclosure, I've tried minoxidil. And I don't think a lot of people realize that some people can have bad reactions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I used minoxidil. Oh, yeah. You buy it over the counter. I thought, what's the big deal? I'm going to try it. I did not know it could make you feel dizzy, Dude, lightheaded, crazy. and like shit. I had no idea. I came to work. I remember I'm talking like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Something's not right. I don't feel good. I was telling my wife. This was like a week of just me feeling like I think I'm dying. Like, what the hell's going on? And I had to put two and two together and go, wait, this is what did I change? This also can lower blood pressure. Is this affecting? And I stopped using it, it was gone. I tried it again, came back. Same thing. So a lot of people, you got the same thing from that? Okay. Oh so, yeah. Pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. All right. So let's talk about the different pathways that contribute to hair loss. Blood flow is one. Yeah, blood flow. And then, you know, without trying to write a research paper here, um, you have mitochondrial health. Okay. And then you're also gonna have, you know, the uh, stem cell state in the follicle. So you, that gets a little more complex, but you have multiple types of stem cells that are always there living in the follicle, um, you know, regenerating, replacing. And then you have the overall inflammatory state. Yeah, I was about to say, in the environment now, like if you're a, uh, you know, an outdoor worker and you're exposed to heavy metals or really just like harsh elements, like you're in the sun, you're not wearing a hat. I mean, that's the microinflammations that are occurring in your scalp. I mean, you know, that's taking down your hair. Okay. This so, is also what supports the research why, I guess, red light therapy is supposed right. to help exactly. for hair loss too then. Improves mitochondrial, mitochondrial health. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, wow. So, like, would using that with something like, like supercharge this? I mean, if you were- Oh, yeah. Oh, it it absolutely does. Dramatically. Oh, very cool. So, there's actually published work, for example, showing that, um, in this case, I think they were doing it for wound healing, but um, GHK regenerates lots of things. is also great for wound healing, sunburns. You know, mm -hmm. um, but when you combine GHKCU and red light, uh, you get a net, uh, you know, combined effect that's greater than either one on its own. Wow! Oh, so it's like yeah. this, they amplify each other. Yeah, wow. synergistic. It's synergistic. Effect. Yeah. Okay, so you guys, uh, in, when we talked the last time you were on the show, Jay, you're like, "Oh, we got this thing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. It's going to change everything. It's for hair loss. Just wait till I, you know, whatever." Um, and now I'm uh, 44 years old. Uh, over the last, I'd say, 10 years, my, I've been slowly kind of losing my hair, and it's been getting a little faster. I guess I'm at that age. It's a, a genetic, right? Yeah, of my, course. It's part. You know, my my dad's almost lost all of his hair. My grandfather yeah. was bald as, you know, as heck or whatever. So I started using it. I've only been using what you sent me over the last maybe three or four weeks. And uh, the girl that cuts my hair is like, "Oh, what are you doing?" And I said nothing to her. She's like, "I could tell a different." And what I noticed was the hair loss really slowed down and almost stopped. That's the first thing that I noticed. 
So I texted, I remember texting. From the hairs you were counting in the shower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Other stuff. Who knows? So I, I texted Jay. I'm like, what's in this specifically? So I want, I want to, let's talk about that. Like, what are the, how are you targeting all these different pathways? Here's the what guy. Are we working with? Yeah. <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing here? So I guess two parts. So from a, an approach perspective, 50,000 foot view is if you look at the overall landscape and what's currently being done, we can go after DHT, right? Like we know mm. that works. If you use minoxidil or, um, you know, other like finasteride, you absolutely get hair growth, right? Okay. But now you start to get other issues. So for example, with minoxidil, even if you have no side, yeah, no side effects, no negative issues from it, you grow some hair, great. Well, what? Within two to three weeks of stopping to use it, oh, um, falls out. Y- yeah. you're going to be obviously losing it. So- and worse, right? Yeah. Amplified because yeah. it attaches to the receptors and now it's not attached anymore when you stop. So that was it. my experience. Hair of, falls I, out. I went years ago, I used like Bosley and all these products. And like, you know, I, all I would get from it is I'd feel like a little bit of peach fuzz I would get. And then when I'd stopped, it felt like worse. It worse. No, it was before. worse. But no, that's the biological mechanism of action. And that's right. why we're saying uh, Big Pharma, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game, yeah. right? Like they've got the greatest game ever. You got to stay on a DHT inhibitor for the minimal hair regrowth if you get it, but you got to deal with the side effects. It mm. absolutely can get worse because you stimulated <laughs> new growth without repairing all the underlying exactly. pathways. So the second that supporting factor of say minoxidil is gone, all that additional inflammation, cellular dysfunction that had built up, well, guess what? Now it just comes back full force. Well, Nick, let me ask you this too, because I know this with other uh, substances. When you block a receptor or block um, a fundamental biological um, compound in your body from attaching to receptor, one of the ways your body adapts is by upregulating those receptors. In other words, they found this in men. As men get older, healthy men get older, their testosterone levels tend to drop but their androgen receptor density tends to go up mm-hmm. because the body says less testosterone, increased receptor density. Right. Now your lower testosterone is as effective right. as the higher testosterone was. Okay. If you're blocking DHT or blocking DHT receptors, does your body upregulate those receptors to try to offset or try to, to uh, you know, to kind of control for that? And then when you go off, now DHT is back with a vengeance and you got more receptors. So it's much worse. I have not personally seen a lot of work on that. There is work that uh, suggests that that is the case. Okay. And you would expect that to be the right, case. Right, of course. Because you see that in almost any receptor, uh, whether it's testosterone or for dopamine, serotonin. Okay. Uh, you see that. So estrogen, I'm on the right. estrogen, AIs, same thing. Yeah. Okay, so I'm on the right path with that. Absolutely. Because that, that, that to me would make the most sense why you get a rebound of hair loss and worse than you were when you first started. Well, again, it's attaching to the receptor, right? So why it's attached, even though, as he said, it's not addressing all the downstream issues. As soon as it's not attached, then why would it stay there anymore? Sure, sure. It's, it's kind of like taking, you know, a whole big, giant, crazy stack um, of weight loss drugs or an, uh, androgenic compounds and not really having a good diet, only training a fraction, which you should. Yeah, you're still going to get results. Let's be honest, Right. And then the second you stop those compounds, it's all going away and you're going to be in worse shape than you were For before. Sure. Yeah, yeah. People experience that all the time in our space. Yeah. Okay, so uh, blood flow, mitochondrial health, DHT, are those the three main so things th- that So those at? are the core and then okay. there are subsets under those. Um, so basically to take a step back answering your question here, yeah. um, originally Jay was, you know, when we started some skincare products originally, he was busting my butt like, hey, you know, you're a smart guy, you know some stuff, figure out the hair thing. And I was kind of like, dude, uh, you know. He doesn't have a hair problem. Yeah, like, I, 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 <laughs> I kind of do don't hey, care. Hey, bro, I need my like, hair, fix it. <laughs> yeah, like, it, hair is not my problem, man. Like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I like the sunburn stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, and he, he kept, you know, poking me about it. So I was like, you know, let me dig into it. And when I dug into it, I'm like, this is actually pre- pretty fascinating. And it looked, at least in theory, um, by taking a look pretty quickly that there are multiple potential avenues you can engage to produce very real effects without having to get into the DHT game. Mm. So ordered some stuff, made some stuff, and I was like, hey, Jay, try this. Um, and the original version was, you know, it, it was messy, not user-friendly, more of a proof of concept. But it worked. Uh, but it worked. Um, so now um, with the company I just recently started, it's essentially the evolved version of that. 
So, hey, proof of concept, it actually it worked. It worked relatively well for a lot of people. Something important to keep in mind with hair loss is it is very complex. So not every solution works for everybody. Right. Um, I don't care what it is. You can have some people who rave, for example, about PRP, right? Yeah. And then you have people who are like, it did nothing. Did nothing. Like, yeah, like, dude, literally, it did nothing for me, and I just dropped five grand. What's up? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it's a tool, but this gets into the whole. I'm sure you guys know this better than a lot of people. The whole end of one concept. Yeah. Yes. Right. We are all, you know, slightly different biologically from each other. We we are not, you know, cut and paste of each other. Mm. So what works. Great in one person is not necessarily going to work great in another. And so fundamentally, at the end of the day, you have to understand that and be willing to adjust to find what works for your system. Hmm. So, But your approach is let's look at, let's uh, affect as many of the pathways that affect hair loss as possible so we can positively affect as many people as possible. At least that's the way it was communicated yeah. uh, to yeah. me yeah. by Jay. Essentially okay. an engineering approach, right? So like okay. we have a complex system here. There are multiple things going wrong. If we can avoid it, we don't really want to start messing with hormones because that's a whole nother, you know, can of worms you don't want to open. Okay, cool. Well, there's a lot of other things we can do here. And the cool thing about human physiology, as you guys know, is the majority of the time, if you can give it a little bit of help, your body will start to fix yep. itself. Mm, you know, right. that, that's kind of the a core principle really behind peptides is – if you can help your body turn on the right things or provide the right conditions, your body knows how to fix stuff. It mm. will go fix stuff. Can, oh, can we talk about what is what you guys put in this product? What what peptides and what they're trying to is attack? it more than one peptide or is it? Yeah, yeah so oh. I, there are three peptides and then uh, fullerenes, carbon sixty. So you know, right now we're keeping it as a proprietary uh, proprietary formulation as we're working out the IP around it and mm -hmm. all this and all that. Um, the one everybody knows because you know it the second you see the color, it's blue, right? Mm. GHKCU. That's the one you've been talking about. Okay. Right. GHKCU does a lot of things. Um, one of the really cool things it does, and this is a very bare bones d description, is it can actually impact the cell at the level of DNA, um, switching it from an unhealthy state to a healthy state. And what I mean by that is you got an average Joe sitting on the couch, you know, getting a little hefty. You know, dude, I should go to the gym, but I don't feel like it. And like, he really doesn't want to get off the couch because starting in the gym sucks. Mm. Um, GHK is the equivalent of coming along and kicking him in the butt and being like, dude, get your butt off the couch and go get in the gym. Okay. And oh, cool. Well, now he's going to start his health, his, you know, his appearance, everything is going to get better because he actually got back in the gym, right? GHK does a similar thing actually through multiple pathways. Okay. So it's like a pro health. Uh, avenue when it comes to the, the the DNA and maybe mitochondria of the scalp if you put it on? Yeah. Um, and on top of that, it it is also fairly good angiogenesis, yeah, meaning angiogenic. creating uh, new blood vessels. Oh. So it's actually repairing existing blood flow in the area and gen stimulating the creation of new blood flow. So, hey, you got some clogged pipes. This is going to start working to help repair those clogged pipes, but at the same time, it's going to put in some new pipes. Mm. By the way, when you rub this, uh, some because someone might ask, like, you know, if you rub it on your skin, does it actually get in that way? This 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 one obviously does. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a lot of peptides, most peptides, honestly, will be absorbed in the skin. The, the question is how deep. Yeah. Mm. So can I make a transdermal peptide cream, um, meaning being absorbed through the skin? The reality is, generally speaking, probably not. Um, once molecules get over a certain size – they can be absorbed into the skin, but not pass all the way through and be systemically distributed. Got it. So in this case, that's actually a benefit because we want everything focused on your scalp. I don't want it going anywhere else. Not okay. that it would cause a problem, right? It would just help improve things other places. But if we're focusing on your hair growth, well, we want it to all stay here, and that's perfect. So you will see debates and arguments about that. Oh, like peptides uh, don't work topically. To the micron well, size. <laughs> what are you trying to do with them? Mm. Are you trying to get a systemic fi effect, fix your knee, fix your shoulder, whatever it is? Or are you trying to fix the skin? Right. Got it. That's so that, I was just going to ask you, at first it sounded like, oh, well, then this would also seem to work if I had knee pain. But no, because it's not going to penetrate deep enough. So it, would, it wouldn't be ideal to rub it on your knee if you had an injury. It'll help with the hair regrowth on your knee, maybe. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> it would, well, actually. Yeah. So the way I originally got into basically peptide skin care type products is I was doing a lot of uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo. Hmm. And those geese, if you're familiar with them, are, they're almost like freaking sandpaper. They're so yeah. coarse. Yeah, you come out with gee burns all the time. Yeah. I did it for years. So. And, you know, my skin's very fair. It's very sensitive. 
and I was training five to six days a week. And I was getting to the point where the skin on my face was getting worn so thin that I'd be training, feel like I was sweating and wipe my forehead or my cheek. And I was sweating blood. Yeah. My skin was getting that thin. And I was like, this isn't cool. Um, so, you know, essentially said, you know what? I know dermatologists aren't going to have an answer, but I'll <laughs> give it a shot. Went through a few. And as soon as I would walk in, I'd be like, corticosteroids. You know, like, I, I don't want to hear the word corticosteroids. Tell me what else you got. <laughs> and after like the third person, I'm like, nope, I they got this. Like else. I'd already fixed my shoulder before at that point. So I'm like, I know there's an answer in the peptide world. Honestly, it only took about an hour or so of digging. And I'm like, oh, GHKCU. Hmm. Um, so, you know, at, at that point, you couldn't get a lot of peptides as easily as you can now. Uh, fortunately, with my background in pharma and biotech, a little easier for me to get some of that. You got the hookups. <laughs> yes. So literally. Yeah. So, you know, m made a phone call, got some sent to me, um, just made a, a super, super simple serum with it um, at about a 3% concentration. And within five days, it was day and night. Um, within three weeks, my skin was completely normal. And then a month later, he sent it to my wife and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's <laughs> GHKCU. And then you said there's a, a few other, a couple other compounds or, yep. or peptides in uh, this hair product. What else is in there? So uh, you have carbon-60 fullerenes. So if you look at it, it's uh, a bunch of carbon atoms, in this case, 60, C60, um, connected to look like a soccer ball. Um, the cool thing about this molecule is that it essentially acts like a super antioxidant. Um, think of a, a soccer ball and think of every point. So you have all the... Uh, the hexagons around the soccer ball, mm -hmm. at each of those connecting points, this molecule can take on a reactive oxygen species. Oh, okay. So it can absorb waste, but it can absorb an absolutely massive amount it's of- It's like it. a molecular sponge. Oh, carbon. Yeah. So yeah. Just like when you uh, take a- uh, Yes. Uh, yeah, activate a charcoal. Exactly. Yeah, just a super Very fancy similar. effect version of oh, it, essentially. So basically, so for people that know, you take activated charcoal has been used forever uh, with poison. You take it, it absorbs the- poison and then it makes it inert and yep. you get rid of the activated charcoal and the poison now has no effect. So is that what's happening in your scalp? It's getting rid of the waste, making it essentially so it doesn't cause the same amount of damage type of deal? Correct. It's helping clear out all the waste that's clogged in the pipes. Oh, okay. And then it's also, it's almost dual edged or, or, or double in that it also allows for the angiogenic effect of the GHKCU to even absorb even better into the scalp. Oh, interesting. It, now, also, if you, if you were, sorry to cut you off, but you got my going down a rabbit hole here maybe um if if you were somebody who had like a balding in your family would you be far better off starting uh, using this on a consistent basis than waiting until you're like at my place 100 percent. Right? <laughs> okay so this could be like almost like a like a therapeutic thing that you would just keep so, in. so one thing that he taught me and educated me on and i want like all of your listening audience because i've been doing it for four years to mine to understand is that this is a scalp health product. It is not something that we put into our hair and see, and, and by the way, you know, cause you were talking about men, this works as you know, better for women than it does for men. Okay. Oh, wow. So let's be very clear about that. So your ladies, which you guys have a massive ladies audience, you know, will autoimmune dysregulation, hormonally related hair loss, perimenopausal, premenopausal, postmenopausal hair loss. This product literally stops it in its track. And it, again, because most women's hair loss is due to you know, age-related stuff, anxiety, worry, stress, you know, they're the maternal, they're always worrying about somebody in the family or the kids or whatever. And this, so this product massively improves the angiogenesis in the scalp. And really it just improves the health of the scalp. Now, one of the issues that we found is that a lot of women will get so excited because they see regrowth fast. You know, I was telling you guys this, they carry diaries around, right? Mm. They're like literally oh, listing yeah, how many hairs they lose yep. per day. Right. And then all of a sudden this starts working. Amazing. The hair stops falling out similar to what you experienced. And they're like, more is better. And then they start putting it into their hair. And we're like, no, you know, if you have long hair, like most women, you got to get it into the scalp. And so that's why we use, and we can get into that, but why we tell people about, you know, microneedling and just, I was just getting stuff that. deeper into the yep. scalp to help it. But to I, your question, yes, this is a, uh, every day, every other day, health of the scalp product that will strengthen the follicle and improve hair regrowth over time. Now, to, to, to piggyback off what he said, is once the follicle, you lost the hair, is there a point of no return? The follicle's dead, that's Amazing it. Amazing question. Yeah. And the answer is actually no. Uh, <laughs> there's been- Cue balls. There's still help or hope, huh? 
Look what you just did to Adam right there now. Is, Please don't lie to him. I mean, he's he's so happy right now. Don't, don't lie to him. No, there's published out research out there that shows that you can, re, you know, the follicles are not actually fully dead and gone. Um, they can be re-stimulated, regenerated. Now, in the published research, it's not done through the same methods I'm using, but that's irrelevant because it's showing that it can be done. Mm. So now the question is just how do you go about it? Now, what you have to keep in mind, though, is that that is a very, very slow process. It's oh. not like, oh, I'm going to fix this in a month, maybe two. Like, no, 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 no. Let, let, let's talk more like six to 12 months. Oh. Well, do you guys know Richard Cooper? You know, he's an entrepreneur in cars. He's got a huge YouTube audience, a couple million people, but he st he's like you. Mm. And we gave it to him, you know, I did but a podcast. When you say like him. you, you mean bold? Yeah. Okay. Not, 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 as, <laughs> not as amazing as you, oh, yeah. of course. Okay. No, Richard's great. You guys would love Richard. You, okay. He's just one of us. But bottom line is, Chrome Dome, he started putting on it. And remember, the the he's got pictures. I mean, he literally grew like half an inch of peach fuzz all over his head. And wow. then he just shaved it off because he just likes going Chrome Dome. But he was like, it works. Wow. So we know that even guys without active follicles, if they wow. give it enough time, and he gave it 90 days. And he was like, that's the most hair I've ever grown since I literally started shaving my head. Wow. So wow. we know it does work, but it would take a long just time. Just takes longer. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. you know, before we get into the, the, the other compound that's in there, you mentioned something called microneedling. So I did learn this on my own. So I, you guys sent me samples. I've been using it for a short period of time. Like I said, I could tell yep. something's going on. And then I was online reading about, um, you know, other things people do or whatever. And I kept reading about microneedling and you, where they have like this roller and you like roll it over your scalp and then it helps with absorption. Okay, so that's not bullshit. That's a legit thing. No. That's 100% so, uh, legit. I guess a, a technical term you might hear in a clinic or something like that um, is a healthy wound. Right, okay. So one way to, it sounds very counterintuitive, but one way to improve regeneration of almost any tissue is by causing additional injury to it right. in yeah. the proper way. Right. Got it. So you can look at uh, ultrasound techniques, right? Uh, that's kind of what exercise is, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. The exact right. same thing. That's like, right. well, you put that stimulus, that load on it, and it stimulates your body to regenerate. Right. So you're actually getting a, a dual effect from things like microneedling. Mm. So um, you would microneedle a little bit, then put it on, right. and then you get a better effect. So that increases absorption. So you're getting more into the the, the dermis on the head, into mm -hmm. the scalp, and at a deeper deeper level. But you're also causing a healthy injury to help just further stimulate regeneration of the area. Yeah, because microneedling by it, this is what I read, by itself sometimes helps Works. with, re with yeah. hair yeah. regrowth. Yes. Okay. So, okay, so if someone like me who actually has a juve light too, it, what oh. tell, step me through this. Like I get out of the shower, I do the microneedling, I apply it, and then yeah. I would, would sit maybe in the right then and there or yeah. a different yeah. time. Three, no, min uh, three uh, minutes to four it, minutes. Yeah. Just yeah. lightly massage it in. So yeah. get out of the shower, microneedle with whatever needle size you prefer. Yeah. Um, apply it and just massage it in and then, and then go sit under your juve light for three to 10, four minutes. 15 minutes. I mean, if you yeah. want to do 15, 20, you can, but I mean, most of the guys that did it usually do three to five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And you I can mean, do it twice a day too. You know, you can I haven't put seen it Adam more in so long about this. You have no idea. <laughs> well, I already, so I actually, when we first, we, when we first started messing with juve, I thought that was all bullshit way back when. And I remember the, the deeper we went in all the research, we're like, damn, this actually is not like super yeah. research. Yeah. And uh, what I noticed, and it wasn't even on purpose, I actually, like my, I would sit, because you know, I'd do my 20 minutes or what I thought, you know, naked in front of my juve, and I'd be like this, <laughs> and I'd just be like looking yeah. down. And I, what I noticed is this, this was before I knew that it would did that for my hair. I was like, dude, I feel like my hair is getting <laughs> And then sure shit, I think Sal was the one who went in. Like, he's like, bro, actually, it actually shows that it's supposed to do that. So I already see some of the benefits from yeah. that. I can only yeah. imagine combining the two of the them. The super stack. Yeah. yeah. Well, so to optimize mitochondria too, we talked about this. So we created, you know, a stack and, you know, sent it out. And I'll send it to you guys and stuff. But, you you know, Metformin, again, yeah. massive mm -hmm. mitochondrial upregulation. So, um, and, and, and any, anything that's going to get rid of, I mean, not systemic, but topical inflammation in the scalp. Okay. Right. So like, um, and as you told me, dude, hanging upside down, if you hang Blood upside flow. down in a traction thing uh, for 10 minutes a day, or even do it twice a day for six or seven minutes, that will help too. Imagine hanging upside down with the juve light hitting on I, my Bro, head. you're going to do everything, aren't you? <laughs> Adam's going <laughs> to do it all, bro. You kind of want to fuck with so, that a little bit. I mean, yeah. that'd feel good traction on my spine anyways. Remember, kill, yeah. kill two birds one stone. I mean, it yeah. feels amazing to be in the zero gravity. Yeah. yeah, yeah it yeah, does, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the challenge with you know all those things Jay just touched on is – you know, anybody who's going down that rabbit hole is keeping perspective, right? Because yeah. it's easy to get lost in the weeds. Uh, I, you know, there are legit oral supplements you can take that do support hair Definitely. growth. 
are they going to regrow your hair overnight? Will you even notice anything on those alone? Spermidine. Probably not. Right. But you have to look at the system as a whole and the cost benefit for you. Right. So if you're like, hey, I'm Mr. Fitness, I'm Mr. Optimization, I have every single one of these tools and every single one of those supplements in my cabinet and yeah. I already take 50 supplements a day, cool, do it all. Yeah. You know, if you're more of an average dude, you're like, what's a red light? Yeah. You know, yeah. what's what's going to make the biggest impact? Yeah, is basically what you're saying. Well, it's also very, very important that we say this, and you know, he always would push me. And we, and you know, in the beginning of our company, we didn't do this. You know, very honestly, we made this mistake, and we went out there and raved and said, "Hey, it works in the majority of users, right?" Because that's the feedback that we got. I'll tell you who it doesn't work in. It it does not work in people who are dumpster fires. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> basically, let's just be really honest. I mean, again, in Nick, other words, Nick if you're showed like me, super unhealthy. Is bro, what you're saying, Nick right? showed right. me the research, and let's just put it this way: in the most simplistic terms, that pe and peptides in and of itself, like they imitate the cellular health of the end user. Yeah, yeah. So if you are inflamed, obese, you know, pouring sugar and alcohol into your body at high rates. You're, it's not going to work. I'm I mean, actually I mean, really glad. Never I'm see really that. glad you said that because I mean, yes. this is how we talk about any sort of supplement or thing that or you take. Or even fitness, like yeah, you can even working out. It's like yeah. you. These people think that you're going to take this, this, you know, creatine or right. a protein powder or any anything, and they're like, <laughs> "Come on, bro, you mean train?" Yeah, and you're doing all this <laughs> other shit. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, well, come on. I mean, like all those things are great and valuable, but I mean, take care of the big rocks first. Yeah. Like, yeah. Kick, exactly. kick the bad shit out. No, first. I'm so. Like, it's, it makes so much. We hear this with fitness. So yeah. if I lift weights once a week, that'll speed up my metabolism enough to where I can eat like 85,000 <laughs> right, calories. No, right, no, 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 right. Not that two much. pizzas and two <laughs> yeah, yeah, packs yeah. of doc <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> you had the G GHKCU. Right. You talked about, what was the carbon? The carbon 60. Yeah. Carbon 60. And then there's something else. Yeah. Um, and then there are actually two other compounds. Oh, two others. Okay. Um, one is a, uh, a biotin. Uh, it's a, a short peptide chain with biotin attached okay. to it. I see shampoos with biotin. What is that? Yeah. Right. So uh, biotin is used in multiple processes in the body. Um, it is actually um, a key molecule for hair health and okay. hair growth. You do normally have it in your diet. Um, and you'll see a lot of mixed stuff on biotin. Some people say, and it does nothing. And others, it, hey, it, it does amazing things. That's where you get into what's your health state. You know, right. What What is your N of 1? How does your body operate? So- the biotin peptide is, is doing two things. It does have its own regenerative mechanisms, very, very similar to GHKCU. So that's primarily overlap from that portion of it. Mm -hmm. But you're also, by having the biotin attached to it, you're also helping directly deliver it to those systems while you're regenerating them. Okay. So an interesting effect um, you do get in some people. You know, we don't market this because it, it is more of a variable effect. Um, but in some people, it will accelerate the reproduction of pigment. So, hey, I'm starting to go gray. Yeah, I'm starting true. to go white. Um, like in my family, um, we don't go gray. We just go white. Mm -hmm. My sideburns are getting a little more white than I wanted. Mm -hmm. So, it, I, you know, I tested it on myself. Like we saw it on Jay when Jay was running. I mean, my hair is a lot darker using this product. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once again, but, you know, Jay's in, just to be blunt and, you know, better uh, overall health than I am. But, not, you know, I'm in pretty good health as well. Within two weeks, I was just using all my sideburns every morning after the shower. Darker. I was like, dude, Darker. I'm like, holy cow. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So we don't promote that, but it is a noticeable effect. And women who take the product see their hair dark and go to their natural okay. root a lot. I, I noticed that from uh, supplementing with copper. I actually my copper. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the GHKCU right there. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. So the copper alone, the GHKCU alone, a lot of times won't do it. But when you combine it um, with biotin compounds, yep. you start to see that far more often. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I got a, uh, we have a functional medicine uh, practitioner we work with. It's phenomenal. Dr. Stephen Cabral. We did this whole like, test panel, whatever. Mm -hmm. And my zinc and copper were way off. So I started supplementing with a, a selenium copper supplement, mm -hmm. whatever. And my hair got darker from yep. it as yep. a result. And I didn't make all the grays go away, obviously, but it did make uh, yeah. a bit of a difference. Salt and pepper. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um, and then you said there was one more. There's one more. Um, so keratogen keratin genesis okay. um, occurs in the base of the follicle. It's one of the key pathways of growing hair, maintaining its health and the health of the follicle. Um, over time, that process can start to go off track for any number of reasons, from age, from inflammation buildup, once again, that related to DHT, right? Mm -hmm. Restricted blood flow. So there is an additional peptide in there that stimulates and helps rebuild that pathway. Awesome. So how excited are you guys about this? Because this market is massive. Yeah. I mean, if, if you know, and look, we've, we've tried it, we experimented with it. I have family members. Yep. 
that have been using it. And it's only been a few weeks that yeah. I've, so I had, before you guys even sent us samples, I told them, so they went out and bought it on their own. And uh, it's been like three or four weeks and I have uh, my brother and a friend of mine and an, a cousin using it. Nice. And all of them are like, uh, this is kind of weird. I think it's, yeah. <laughs> it's working. Well, that's well, the, that's the, but it's only been a few but, weeks. But that's okay. But that's something that, so there's two things we definitely got to hit before we end this podcast. And that is what you just said is critically important. Most people have been conditioned and trained. Let's just call it brainwashed to believe that hair regrowth products are scams. Right. Yes. So like to even see results, yes. they're like, whoa, it's this is something's weird here, bro. Yeah, Cause I think it's working. That's what they're saying. And then the other thing, and this is probably even like even more mission critical is to understand that it's not, as he said, going to work for every single person mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, depending on your cellular health, you're going to get a better effect technically or theoretically if you have good cellular health. So if you're a, a normal mind pump listener, and I know you guys have a lot of people who do take great care of themselves, this product is definitely going to work. Okay, good. Because, uh, yeah, full disclosure, the people that I mentioned are all pretty fit and healthy. Of course. Yeah, well, well, I, I think of course. To, what I'm getting from this too, especially when we, you shared all the stuff with peptides and just like how it's a, a, like a natural key to the body. It's like, this is not like a drug that you can have all this adverse effects to. So to me, I see tremendous value in, in even more than myself. I know we're joking and teasing about me, but like people like Sal and Doug who are like still have a lot of their hair and thinning. It just has a practice of just like, you should just, they should yeah. be part of your hundred percent well, washing uh, your head. Uh, type I'll of give routine. you an example. Um, it probably won't be until first quarter of 2024 or so, but you know, we will ultimately be launching essentially either a shampoo or conditioner I was gonna ask right. for, that. for exactly that point. Yeah. And you know, to your guys point, I'll give you an example, right? Obviously I have no issue with hair. Um, however, my son, you know, he's a teenager, but look at his grandfather. His grandfather was bald when he was like 25. Right. Mom's, mm. mom's so the, the reality is, and he's even asked me, he's been like, so dad, if I start having an issue, <laughs> will this work for me? And yeah. I was like, yeah, like honestly. And, and I, I told him like, if, if I even thought I started to see an issue, I would get you started on a shampoo or conditioner. That way it just never becomes mm. an issue. Just right. two or three times a week, put this in your hair. Like, so what we'll probably do is actually women are more used to this than men. But a leave in overnight conditioner. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. you know, do sure. your normal shower routine, wash your hair, you know, whatever your shower routine is. Then, right before you get out, um, just kind of squeeze all the water out of your hair. Then, you know, work this into the scalp primarily. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just get out, dry off, and go to bed. Just, mm -hmm. Everybody's got to remember it's a scalp health product. So, you got to get into the scalp. Now, one other thing that just hit me, and I didn't want to forget because you were the one that reminded me. So, for all the guys out there that are on finasteride, they're on minoxidil, oh, they're yeah. on dutasteride, Thank you. right? And you don't just go off. They're over. hearing this now and they're like, oh shit, right? So it's like, what do they do? And obviously Nick and I, it, it took us nine months to develop this program. I mean, we had theories that we could do it right away, but we wanted to work with people. So this is what you do. You basically continue on with your uh, DHT inhibitor, whatever it is, again, Propecia. I mean, uh, yeah, Propecia, which is finasteride, dutasteride, or minoxidil. But you separate your application so that one uh, is in the morning and one is at night. And meaning the second application is this product, right? Oh, okay. And again, by the way, the product is called Folatin, but you would do that until your scalp health improved enough, which is normally what, two to four weeks, that you can now stop the DHD inhibitor cold turkey. And what won't happen, which they're all used to, which you experience, you experience, and I experience, yeah, it is worse. it won't fall out now because the health of your scalp has improved so much from the Folatin, the peptide-based products and the angiogenic effects that killing the DHD inhibitor cold turkey will not cause the hair to fall So out. take one in the morning, one at night, do this long enough to where you're like, okay, I've done this now for a few months. Now I can start Think about I don't even think you have to go a couple like months. Addiction, honestly, right. I, mean, yeah. I, I don't think you have to go a couple analogy. months. I think we, we found most of our users were after four weeks, they could kill it. So yeah. after four weeks, and they go off and then they're all Yeah, there. and yeah. even then, um, the, the general broad suggestion would be ease off over a saying? week or two. Cut it in half. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Order, then yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now, I have, another, I have yeah. another question because, um, you know, I, having trained so many clients, I remember a lot of female clients would complain about hair loss in their eyebrows. I had male clients who their beard was, yep. does this work on other parts of the body? So it, it actually does. So, uh, you know, I, I have a, a yes. small group of both uh, men and women that, you know, I have test drive any of my products for me and uh, they've all used it like that just because like, Hey, kind of like you're thinking, right? Well, if it's working on my head, what else is that going to work on? Mm. Um, now, ultimately we will be having, 
the biology does begin to differ a little bit once you get off the head. Okay. Um, so it does work. Um, ultimately, we will have formulations targeted specifically mm. to that. Okay. Uh, just so it's like eyebrows is a big one now nowadays because yeah, uh, the, the yeah. style for eyebrows changes. When I was young, it was like thin, yeah, sparse exactly. eyebrows. Now it's thicker. Now it's thicker, and some women pluck yeah. the hell out of the eyebrows to the point where now, now it's like it doesn't grow back. So, and- uh, one of the women who uh, tests products for me, um, she plucked her eyebrows for so long, she ended up just getting them tattooed on mm. because they they wouldn't grow anymore. And but she still wanted them thicker than you know the the tattoos were, and she's like, I don't want to do you know. I don't want to do that because then if I don't want to go back, I, I kind of got yeah, an issue. Tattoo, yeah. So she's like, is this going to like hurt me if I rub it on my eyebrows? I'm like, no. I'm like, I, I won't guarantee you it's going to do anything. And I get a, a call about two weeks later, like, holy cow, yeah. like I, I'm going to take a picture and show you my eyebrows. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, this sounds very interesting. Uh, and like, like I said, we've I've had people experiment with it. I've used it myself. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So appreciate you guys coming on the show and follow the name of the product. And uh, I think we'll set people up with the link so they know where to get it if they want to give a shot. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you guys, man. Amazing as always. For sure. Thank you.